Unless you want to hear yourselves as background noise, that'd be fine. You can handle me like, like that if you want. That's fine. All right. So when we were here last time, I had a chance to introduce the phone. Although today we'll get into it. And I always do the hardest part first, which is the So that's really what we'll do the stall and see how fast we can go. We can continue on fast. Yeah. My guess is we have at least two. What's today? Uh, we'll probably be some. So the next Monday is what? That is the fourth. Is that correct? The next Wednesday, rather. Fourth, eleventh, the eighteenth would be the eighteenth or the twenty-fifth. I'll know better next week. So one of those things. So that's really the next major thing. Basically, with a fraction of lids, you'll get one of these. You'll get a data tracking user word bank. You'll get uh, an answer sheet. And I'll have a print. I'll have a bone like this. And it'll be identified the bone. And I'll probably have markers on a couple of features. You'll have to identify the features. That's what you're looking forward to in a few weeks. And we'll have some time in the lab, in the open lab time. And I'm in here other days, so depending on your schedule, I'm going to be able to call it out. I one thing I have my hands in that lab, so I can pull the bones out and find those tools. So that's the backstory for today. So we're going to look at the skull first. And really, part of that handout is the skull. And this is the way you study bones. You study bones by compartmentalizing. You have, so the skull has 22 bones. Cranial bone, by definition, a cranial bone is in contact with your brain, with the coverings of your brain, which you will learn soon are called meninges. So yeah, grab one of those if you want. Knock yourself out. So, there are.
this bone and this bone is already fused together. So even though surely it's identical to the common uh, soft, we consider it as one bone for that bird is this portion. That's silly. I mean, sort of, it sort of isn't, but it is. So if you count those up, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 11, 13, 14, wow. So what's interesting about them are these. I'll put a star next to them. Now I'm putting a star next to them because they participate, and there are seven bones all together, that make up the order of the old computer model. So three of them are skull, are cranial bones, rather, and the others are facial bones. So you do need to remember those because I will already tell you a testimony. We're going to have to name like three bones of the organ out of the seven. Yeah, I that will be on that practical exam. I'm giving you a bone. Don't you thank me? Money will. Money's always good. Get one of those little square things you can put on your bone. I could do that. My kid used to have one of those and you. He did high-level tuning of vehicles. <laughs> Go figure. All right, so here we are. So let me continue on with the saga here. Okie dokie. So uh, you may, I don't know, what you doing in lecture? I always ask this. What, what, are, you, what are you guys into in lecture? Uh, scan yeah, the epidermal. Epidermal. Okay, so we did a little bit of that here too. Okay, then, that's good. Uh, we kind of like what they look like. Okay, cool. very good. All right, all sorts of. So hopefully you're all having the. Uh, we're trying to get the information across. So this is bones are something I. It's 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 part of every every professor has a comfort zone. Bones joints are comfort zone for me. Very much so. So hopefully this will work and the system won't shut down. But you may have seen some of this before. So even though this is all part of the system, we're going to talk about bone. Bone, almost all of your bones come directly from, are made out of cartilage originally and become bone. So all the bones in your extremities start off as cartilage. The only ones that really didn't are the bones in your skull and your clavicles. They have, there's something called intramembranous bone. They're a little bit different. And so we'll look at this. When we look at the joint aspect, we'll look more closely at cartilage and at ligaments. And, and ligament is a commonly used term. The most common usage of the term is how bones are held together. They are held together with ligaments. So it's a fair amount of your body mass. Your muscles are by far and away the most. And there are two skeletons aspects axial core so that's the head neck spine chest apparatus that's basically all of those are the axial bones and you're going to see that repeats itself when we start talking about muscles we talk about axial or core muscles we talk about and then the other are appendicular having to do with the appendages arms and legs and by definition in bones that's the connector. So your shoulder assembly and hip assembly, which we're not going to do today, we will do next week, are by definition part of it. You can make an argument they're part of the core, but in, in proper anatomy, we don't do that. So skull, the vertebral column, we may, we'll probably get a little bit of that in today. And the thoracic cage, which there isn't a whole lot about. And the sternum, which we, which we consider part of that as well, are all part of the axial skeleton, the long axis, support the head and neck. Biggest job I think they do is protect the brain, the spinal cord, and the thoracic organs, which are basically your heart and your lungs. So it's not extraordinarily important. And so color-wise, they're showing you the greenish ones are your axial skeleton and everything else. As you can see, the shoulder and the hip assembly is appendicular. Same deal on the back. So you can see it a little more closely. You can see the assembled vertebral column. We, I am told we have, we have a new skeleton that they're going to have to put together. So hopefully they'll have that done in the next couple of weeks. You'll be able to see it. Because all these other ones are, yeah, and I've been 
teaching this class here for 15 years. Okay. You get to play with them. We have real ones and plastic and ones. Right. Europe not plastic. I'll show you the difference when we get when we get into them. Yeah. Play with them. You're gonna to have to hold them. You're gonna have to, I, I'm gonna have them out on a table above. So it may be plastic. Plastic is useful because it really reflects everything. Real bones are interesting, but they deteriorate. And what happened when we formed this biology department or science department, maybe 20 years ago or so, here a little bit more than that, uh, Dr. Dress, who some of you are going to have for micro and micro lab, uh, he was our department chair. He told me that they, that another college was replacing or university replacing all their bones and they were selling them, like on eBay or something like that. We just bought a, a bunch. So a lot of these are pretty well beat up. They're very expensive to replace. I'll tell you that now. So yeah, you're going to be, it's all touch. This is, this, this is the best part because it's hands on with regard to the bones. Muscles, we have models. Yes, we'll do a dissection of the brain. So you'll be able to, it's a sheep brain, so it's not nearly as big as ours, but it's interesting. But this is, this, this is pretty good stuff. So the skull is, why I do it first? It's the hardest one. Let's get the heck out of the way. Extremity bones, particularly in the lower extremity, legs and thigh, and the bones are bigger, so they're pretty easy to attack, as are the landmarks on the bones are easy. So cranial, close the brain, simple de simple definition, attachment for head and neck muscles. And really what a lot of your, particularly the musculature in the back of your neck and in your back, it's big job is to hold up your head. Okay. Facial bones, framework of your face. Yes, openings for special senses, air and food passage, teeth, muscles of facial expression. Interestingly, the muscles come from those bones and go into this soft tissue under the skin and allow us to smile or blink or move, you know, all those kinds of things that we do, purse your lips, whistle, all those interesting, and we, we, we communicate so much with our face, very much do. I look at that all the time. That's why I'd rather talk to you this way than online because I can see you and see, and I can see whether I'm holding your interest or your board stick. I know my wife doesn't want to listen to me anyway. She was in a very swearingly bad mood. On Sunday night, near the end of the Steelers game, when I was stressed, she said her mom, they had a major water line break. That's in McCandless Township by North Hills Paskin Hospital. And baboom, all of a sudden there's six inches of water, mud, sludge, and sewage sitting in the basement. So she's not very happy with the water people. It had a few very direct comments to make about them to me today that I would not repeat because they're not anything I should repeat. Yes, that kind of language. So facial bones, all of the above, and we'll look at the skull bones and it's the, really the first thing you're going to see is going to be joints in the skull and they're called sutures and you were holding them there and, and if you would, let me, let me feel that for you. Here's a skull model, and somebody colored them in, which is fine, it's easier to see. They're in blue here, or in red here, and not so much colored in here, but you can put a line like that. They are called sutures. In the old days, before we knew about cosmetically putting stitches in, they would just, you know, somebody curled their skin, back in the ancient world with gladiators, they had put a lot of really surgical techniques. We didn't know. That's when the first hypodermic was healed. They would just sew them back together randomly and they had a soil. And they still use the term suit. And that's what these are called, but you'll see that. So, frontal bone is the bone that makes up the forehead. The top of your skull is the parietal bones. There's two, one on each side. And the occipital bone, you see a little bit of that yellow in here. It's back here. And what these should find, I'm sure you we have a uh, rubberized model set, and a big, big hole full of brain and and for a brain and for a mesh on, it's, it's really more or less an opening. And because this is my far away the large skull, because the brain stem is in here and it's not just final fluid, so it gets through. So all of that is part of it. 
And so these are called sutures. There's one that you don't see very well, and this is a different one that goes on that you can just, it's kind of like a yellow, which I'll show it to you. It's kind of it would be like here. It's another suture that's got a name in and of itself. I'm going to get into all of those. What's interesting about all of these sutures, okay, is you see where I have that, that L that's on there, I guess, and there's some here on the left side. And all of the sutures, whether this one or this one or the one back here, all somehow connect to the glide bone. All sutures are absolutely. At least there's another bone of the parietal bone. And it's interesting in babies, those sutures, it's a joint. It's a fibrous joint. And when you're born, the, the joint is still mostly fibrous, so it allows the skull to shift, which many times is necessary to facilitate the actual delivery. And a lot of you moms, you dads, see a baby and the head looks distorted and say, oh my God. And the reality is that it goes back where it's, it's a subtle distortion. There's just that happens. And you can see my first wife, uh, this is a Mazda show for a long time, you know, and, and you know, we're always trying to explain that. So another name we get to those when they're movable is soft spots. But the fancy name is called Fontanelle. So because there's fluid underneath Sometimes it pops out and it has sort of like a little map. So that's Fontanelle. The L L D is the Indian the Spaghetti, Spaghetti, Sony, Actually, that would be more tomato and tomatillo. And the funny is a tomato, tomatillo. No, a tomatillo is a different vegetable. It's a fruit. Tomatoes are a fruit. Tomatillos are like in the gooseberry family. Did you ever have a green, did you ever have a salsa verde at a Mexican restaurant? They make it from jalapenos and tomatillos. And they boil them and then they, you, you buzz them. You get the boat motor out, brr, brr, brr. boat motor, immersion blender, you buzz them. It's okay. Chili quiles are very, very good if you go out, like to try them in San Diego. Very good, very good, 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 good places to go. Love that. Nevertheless, so there's sutures, serrated sawtooth. Here they are. So, Understand, when we talk about the parietal bone, there's not a lot to say about it. These are the sutures. This one, remember we talked about body planes, first lab. Frontal, because it's in the front. Sagittal, because it's this way. Okay? So, yeah, the frontal or coronal plane, remember the plane that went through you this way. Sagittal plane divides you into right and left. So that's the sagittal suture. This is the frontal suture. And then back here, and I'll show it to you, it looks, it's the occipital bone meets that sagittal suture. So it kind of looks like the sagittal suture is coming this way and the occipital bone going this way. And what it reminded anatomists of, letter, the Greek letter lamb. So it's like an upside down lock. If you see it like on a fraternity or a sorority. And so they call it the lamb oil suture. And the one over here is called squamous. And remember, squamous, when we think of them like flattened cells that you're learning about now in lecture, squamous actually, to a certain extent, the original derivation was from shingle. So rather than these being quite sawtooth, there's a little bit more like an overlap, like shingles on your roof. It's interesting. So you just have to remember the name is not where they derive from. So coronal or frontal, both, both are fair. Sagittal, lamboidal, squamous, squamous, whatever you want to pronounce it. Okay. So here are all those bones, and here are the facial bones. So facial bones, cranium is divided, and I'll show you the vaults. So when you talk about the calvaries, it's like in here. Cut the lid off. 
we have this is what happens to bone on some progressive bone. I was telling you about it last time, it's something called Wolf's Law. Bone forms to pressure drop. So frontal lobes are here, temporal lobes in the brain are here, the occipital lobe, is something called the femoral vessel, the cerebellum are back here. And effectively, they have created these cavities. And you can see a number of holes. And the holes are typically where nerves mostly in some blood vessels. So that's when you're talking about the cranial wall, called the calvaria, superior, lateral, posterior portions. So they're fossa by definition, they sort of sort of heavy like depressions that are there, anterior, middle, and posterior. You can see that. Uh, here we go anterior, middle, and posterior. And so you're going to take a look at these holes. And the first little nugget is not every hole is real. When those bones that you were asking about before, when they prepare a bone, whether it's a real one, and then the, art, and the plastic ones are made. So the real ones you can see here are some of the holes. So in order for them, basically what they do is call to donate and use it. Which boils long term, all the connective tissue kind of. Yeah. Like, 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 so one of them is very famous is here. This is called the Brayman laceration. Laceration. Yeah, laceration. It's still a cartilage. There's nothing that goes through it. The cartilage disappears when they prepare the bones. These foramina, that's the plural, that's why I'll go over these again. It's called rotundum, which is round, or valve, which is oval. And this one's, they make it larger than it should be. It's called spinosum. It's like a little spine. They make more difficult. Those are important. Major structures go through that. And the way you build this together, down the road, you're going to see it as our passageways from what are called cranial nerves. So, a branch of the trigeminal nerve goes through that, another branch goes through here. And this one doesn't have a nerve, it's a blood vessel. That blood vessel kind of goes up this way. It's called the middle meningeal artery. We'll get to that probably next term, maybe two. So when someone's struck on the side of the head, either in a fight, or with an object, or in a car accident, you really worry about bleeding. That's what that artery is. So that's one of the things to look for when you have something called the hematoma, a pocket of blood that's pressing and damaging the brain. So there's a lot, thank you very much. There's a lot of that that goes on. So here are the here's the skull, frontal lobe, temporal lobe. This, that's making the big part of that posterior fossa. That's called the cerebellum. We'll get to that in anatomy. You're going to see that when we dissect the brain. And that has these ridges kind of going in a different direction. The ridges are very famous. You're going to learn about that also. They're called sulci and gyri. Sulci are indentations. Gyri are sort of outpouchings that are there. And then the openings and lots of names. And we'll, we'll get to quite a few of them. So this gives you an idea of the cavities that are there and the location of some of the bones. So here's what I wrote out for you, and we'll start here. Okay. The frontal bone is basically your forehead. Okay. There's not a lot to say about it. There is, to me, minimal anatomy. The single most important part, okay, they call this the supra, which means above, orbital margin. Margins are sometimes ridges of the tissue. It's that sort of like where you're a hybrid. You feel that margin of the bone. <laughs> Other than that, there's not a lot of anatomy. What it does with regard to the orbit, the orbit, which is this opening for your eye, you know, you're about orbital fractures. There's no orbital bone, an orbital fracture you have to identify the bone. So the bones that are here in the upper sort of the upper superior margin of the orbit, that's part of the frontal bone. 
and I don't have one that's separate that extends here into the orbit. That's really all I have to say about that. There's not like there's a very big bone, it's a heavy bone, comparatively speaking, and there's not a lot of additional anatomy. And the parietal bones that make up those sutures, there's really no relevant anatomy other than participates in all of the names. The first one of these that has some significant anatomy is this guy. That's the occipital bone. And though it's not an exact fit, it'll work a lot. The occipital bone, that big opening, the spinal cord, brain stem, and the spinal cord has to appear somewhat material. And it sits on top of it. And so I'll show you the plastic version of this. I don't have the bony version here. It's, so if I were to take this, and it's roughly the same, not exactly, of course. And it sort of sits kind of like that. So it's that ridge area that you can feel on the back of your head extending anteriorly or if you go forward to create this somewhat of an extension. And you'll see some of the structure that I'm associated So on the back, it has ridges. In the back area of your neck, or this portion of your body is called the nuchal, and you see it's the area. And so these are like supra or above the nuchal line or super nuchal ridges. Not a big deal for us. The big player is here, the brain and magnet. Whenever you hear the name magnet, you use a lot of anatomy. Okay? Magnet means really large. You're going to see it as a big muscle in your thigh, uh, which is really one of the joint muscles called the adductor magnus. And we'll get that with the muscle part of the program. So that's there. These rounded areas here, you can see a little bit of marker on there, are called occipital condyles. You'll see in bone, the name of either for the bone they're on or the bone they're going to. In this case, these occipital condyles, they're on the occipital bone. They sit. On this bone, this is the first cervical vertebrae that's sitting kind of like up here. Okay, first is big. You see, it's got a very famous name. It's called the first cervical vertebrae. It's also known as the axis. Okay, and it's called the axis. Okay, I think it's called the atlas. I beg your pardon. Because the other one below is called the axis. That's why I got confused. The atlas is mythologically was the Mythological character that held up the world. Remember all that mythology? Perseus, mentors. Hey. So it kind of sits, give you an idea, kind of this way. And so it's responsible, those condyles are responsible for you, like moving your head up and down if you were not in the center. Okay, and you can see here continuous with the opening that is the transition between your brain stem and spinal cord. But we're not done yet. On either side, maybe you can see it, but it's hard with the light. You can see a little opening there. That's not artificial, that's real. And I use, I, I go to no expense, literally no expense, to demonstrate this thing to you. So you have an opening here and an opening here on the other side. You look good, don't you? You look there. The one looks good. There's a hole in it. Well, if there was a hole that would be impenetrable, I would put it in there. But it's still there, so you're going to have to imagine the other one goes this way. Okay? And there is a nerve that goes through here. It isn't quite angled so acute that this angle is so far off to the side. It's a little bit straighter like that. So this little opening on either side is called the hypoglossal canal. Glossal means tongue. Hypo means under. Hypoderm, under the skin. And the hypoglossal nerves, which will come to learn, the 12th cranial nerve, they're the ones that are responsible for you sticking out of your Okay. It's one of the things we test when we have somebody stick out their tongue. Not only looking at the tongue to see if there's any damage or 
It's a very good mirror of infectious diseases. Tongues that are coated. When you see spots on the tongue with measles, things like that. Okay. You also basically are testing to see if that nerve that comes out that way is intact. So where there's been again. Sometimes people the tongue will stick out your tongue. And for those of you going into nursing, when you do this, and this is going to be part of what you do, not next term, but the first term of your second year, you do physical assessment, right? That's one of the things you do. It's called surveying and cranial terms. That's why I go over You say, stick out your tongue. Well, if somebody says you stick out your tongue, instinctively, it goes out straight. If someone sticks out their tongue and it goes the wrong way, ah, 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 one side or the other, Basically, you say, hey, just think I should come straight. They go, I am. It's going sideways. That tells you there is a problem with one of these That's not a great sign. It's usually that means you're damaged to break stem. That's not a good sign. Little heads up on all those things. So, that was the frontal bone. And like I said, the frontal bone, even though I didn't change the slide, not a lot to talk about. I'm not worried about for now the sinuses. Or the, or the frame, and there's a little bumpy that's over here. You can feel it on the me medial portion of your eyebrow. I always joke about my, my daughter's first boyfriend, unibrow, just one, you know, cro -Magnum. And And pleasantly enough, he's not in jail as we speak. It's, just, it's okay. He's not a terrible person. Not a terrible person. So I, I, I'll go through the, we'll see a lot of these slides again. The parietal bones, sides of the cranium, most of it here, all the sutures. Same illustration. Here is that occipital, but this is that lamboidal suture. What you see, we all have these. We don't really count them. They're called sutural bones. They're little pieces of bone that make up the sutures. So sometimes there's little, they look like little bone fragments. There, there's nothing unusual about that. We have, a lot of us have little bits of extra bone, interestingly enough. And, and a lot of times it's not anything that indicates any degree of disease or problem. Here's the occipital bone. You can see the line and the ridges, the bump that you feel back here is called the external outside occipital, that bone, protuberance, something sticks out. And here are the condyles that are there. So you can see it again, and I use the same illustrations kind of over and over. <clears throat> Most of the back of the skull articulates with the parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bones. We get to the sphenoid bone. The interesting thing about the skull, usually that's something that's like a test question, is that all the bones, of the, all the cranial bones contact the sphenoid bone. So we call that a cornerstone bone. And you're on in the facial bones, all the facial bones contact in some way, shape, or form. Okay, the maxillary bones. Those are the cornerstone bones when they when they basically are associated with others. Frame and magnum, occipital condyles, hypoglossal form. These guys not that important. Same illustration. Underneath, a couple extra holes to tell you about. see in color here, when you look at it, and I'll, be, I'll use this one that's got all the muscles. These are muscle, muscle attachments. When you look under here, okay, the area that I'm looking at is here. And it's sort of at the meeting, and brown is the occipital bone. And this sort of yellowish color is the temporal bone. Where they come together, there's a gap. That's known as a foramen. You can see it where I put this cotton tip applicator. Okay, wooden Q-tip as it were, here and on the other side here. And you can see the opening is got, it's not round per se, it's more oval or flat. When we see openings like that, veins typically are in there. Veins in the body are wide and somewhat flatter than you think. More arteries, and this is an opening for an artery or more rounded. This is called the jugular brain. 
So a very, very large blood vessel that carries blood back to your heart from your brain is the jugular vein. Most of the time, arteries and veins have the same name. But we don't have a jugular artery. The name to that is a very famous carotid artery. And while it's next to it, has a different name. So we have a carotid artery bringing blood to your brain and the jugular vein bringing blood back to the heart. There aren't a lot of places where you have different names. The heart, when you get to an external, it's like that. has very famous coronary arteries. They supply the heart, and the blood comes back to the heart by way of what are called cardiac veins. Those are about the only two examples. Right here, you take a pulse, thermal artery, on your radio artery. Next is that of radial veins. So I'm almost all of them have the same radial artery, radial vein, thermal artery. Tibial artery, tibial vein, etc. Those are the oddballs. It's always good to remember oddball exceptions. In anatomy, there's a lot of memorization. Remember exceptions. You all guys learned about feedback, right? It's positive and negative. Everything's negative feedback except for two major things blood clotting and delivering a baby badge. It's not the only two, but those are the two. So you remember those two as positive feedback. What kind of feedback is glucose? What kind of feedback is calcium? Because you're all in the moment. Make study least. That's what I'm about, trying to help. All fair. Even those of us who are living in schools for all in Europe. I'm I grew up with something called a professional student. Okay, my happy place is to I'm always in school. When I was in practice, I was more happy when I was in school. So understand that that's what you have to share, I think, as a professor or as an instructor or whatever you are, as a mentor, how the tricks and tricks to help. So that big long-winded thing at the, at the juncture point between these two bones, the occipital and the temporal bones, which we get to next, and the temporal's got a lot of anatomy to have that jugular brain, a lot of important stuff goes through. The temporal bone is difficult. We used to have a temporal bone other than the model. And I have that I'll be back there. We used to actually have a couple of little ones like our that was real. It kind of looks like this. And I for me, you don't have to know right and left. I'll tell you which one's which and you can figure out. So this is, and the most notable piece of anatomy is here. The opening for your ear. Okay. It's called the external, it's not the outside, auditory, okay, meatus. Some people call it the general acoustic meatus down here. What covers that opening? Ear. So that and that's the boundary between your outer ear and the opening, the opening. Middle ear. They're not middle ear infections that most of us had with kids. They maybe had two years we were a kid, my daughter was just. So here's the bone. There's a lot of anatomy that's on that bone. So I'll get the picture and I'll show it to you. So this is the bone, temporal, the te your temple area is here above your ear. So it's named for that area. Here is a very important lobe of your brain that's mostly associated with hearing and balance, that's the temporal lobe. If you know somebody with seizure disorders that some people call epilepsy, okay, and both of those terms are somewhat interchangeable, temporal lobe is a very common area for that problem, by the way. So the temporal bones, one on each side, like the parietal bones, is paired. So we have different regions. You don't have to really know the regions as much as you need to know the structure. So I'm going to show it to you, and I'll, let me get the example that's there. So you can see, even they included the jugular frame, and even though it shares that with the occipital bone, the carotid canal is definitely in the temporal bone. Okay, and then we're going to look at the rest of these structures that are there. So here it is, that color. So I'll show it to you, and then I'm sure they'll have it individually. When we do the exam part, I either have bones or models, and very often, for instance, I'll go, let me just show you with this one. I'll 
print this up. I'll do a call. I'll just do it at home and put a color thing with it. Obviously without the names, but I'll have like arrows or lines pointing to the structures for you to identify. So if you can't, if this is a little harder to figure out, I'll have the diagrams and I'll tell you, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll send you the numbers of the diagrams I typically use. So, you know, I, I'm trying to get the right way to express it. I, I, I'd rather have, I don't want to surprise you. I have, I've had a lot of wonderful colleagues when they do those tests, it's like 30 seconds. Tell me what bone it is, whether it's left or right, and then move to the next one. And I, and, and this lady was wonderful. She does, maybe she's retired, like I should be. Uh, uh, she, she did a lot of anatomy and physiology in their nursing at Carlo. It's a really good school down there next to Pitt. Okay. So, but I, I just didn't agree with the philosophy, but all that aside, let me show you the important parts. So <clears throat> the external acoustic meatus. Here is, there are three what are called processes that are major. Processes are just projections of bone. Behind your ear, behind that meatus is the mastoid. The mastoid is like a channel that helps to amplify sound so when you have a cold and sometimes it's hard to hear things, if it's filled with fluid, you can get a sinus infection there. So that mastoid process is like, a, it's got filled with air and fluid. Normally, that's one area, that bump behind your ear. This is called the styloid process because it's like a stylus, like an old writing implement with a point. They used to, you know, scratch those out into like clay with, with things like that. And you can see it here. So here's the mastoid, it's got a little groove in it. Here's the styloid, this is a left. How do I know it's a left? Because I know the meatus, the external meatus pointing outward. The styloid process you can't feel, but there's a muscle. When you move your neck this way, this muscle is called the sterno, because it comes from the sternum. Clido, because it comes from the clavicle. Mastoid, you're inserting that mastoid process. It kind of surrounds and envelops that styloid process. So that sharp point of bone, you can't feel it's covered in muscle. Okay. And then lastly, this is called the zygomatic process. So a lot of times we name bones, not to from where they are, like the occipital condyle, or where they're going. This is a where they're going bone. So here, mastoid, styloid, this is the zygomatic process that is going to this bone, which is the zygomatic bone. This process, apart from the zygomatic bone, is usually called the temporal process. Together, they form this, as you can feel the extension of your cheekbone. A lot of us just call that our cheekbone. That's called the zygomatic bone. And that's really important because the muscles that help you chew. One called the temporalis kind of goes through there and helps you with your development down. The other one called the masseter attaches to that part and then attaches to the lower part. Learn something here. Those are the big features. On the inside, you've got this. So a meatus is not just an opening, it's a tongue. So external, and therefore this is internal. And then lastly, there's an interesting little opening. So I don't have to get up. It's over. Oops. It's over here, between the mastoid and the styloid. There's a little foramina here called the stylo-mastoid brain. Okay, a little tiny opening. It's the muscle that innervates your face so you can smile, you can move your jaw, you can move your side, those types of things. All your facial expressions, it's called the facial nerve those that's the style of mastoid brain, and they have it on here as well. So again, mastoid process, styloid process, and the opening right there. So the other thing that they have 
is this sort of indentation very close to that thyroid. Okay, and that is a, that's a small fossil, and that fossil is covering part of it, and that's where I'll show you on one of these to be able to get into your eyes. Right there. So when we get to this, the man this mandibular condyle it inserts here, very, very close to that area. So here's the style of masculine framework, I think he is. And just ahead of it, you can see it is here. And that mandibular condyle and that fossa form a very important joint called the temporal mandibular joint. That's the most easily dislocated joint in your body. That's the one that gives way. A lot of people, they open their mouth, go to the dentist, and next thing you know, they have trouble closing. So we have a lot of problems. And sometimes the problems with TMJ or temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, which is sort of a global term, will involve problems with that facial nerve. There's also a very, very famous disease that can come from a viral infection or trauma or for no reason at all or from a tumor. And you may have heard of it's called Bell's palsy. It affects that the nerve, the facial nerve, and people get a facial droop. Okay, one side of their face. You probably have seen it. Maybe you have to do it. Well. Somebody you know how to. Pardon me? Yeah, but there's a lot. We don't really know what causes that. I've seen it after a virus. I've seen it for no reason at all. I've seen it. People had post COVID. Just for instance, there's a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it can be really something nasty. It's underneath it. My former brother in law got a real bad case, and it's probably stress related, when he was working as 9 11 operator in So for about 15 years, and I mean, you're getting called, you know, and you're trying to be calm. The stress levels were meant to, unfortunately, he did. You know, thankfully not anymore, you know, the whole gang would go over for drinks. You have to work a lot. Anyway, you know, he had an alcohol problem. Maybe that it was very interesting. As I saw him. Uh, unfortunately, if you're, if, you're, if you're in Pittsburgh, they had a terrible series of murders at a synagogue on the Squirrel Hill. The doctor who was killed who was one of the other people killed and then Jared Rivera was his family doctor, goes to graduate high school. You know, we both came from New York, Jersey, and ended up here. So, every time I tell that about the Bell's palsy, I think about my former brother-in-law, and he's still around. You know, I'm not, we're not, I'm not married to his sister anymore, but I remember, I, I think about the time I, you know, that, that one of the last times I saw Jerry for that terrible tragedy. So moving on. So that's that bone. Now, those are the easy ones. We've got two hard ones left. I know you you don't believe it, but it's true. The next one, and I'm going to skip the sphenoid because this one in pink is the hardest. We're going to do this guy over here called the ethmoid. Okay. So we're going to skip the sphenoid with all the anatomy that's there. It's a monster. And we get the ethmoid. The ethmoid is imagine if you could put your fingers way, way back, almost behind your eyeballs. That's about where the ethmoid is. And so that would be probably going upwards, and if you put them downward, you'd have the sphenoid. So those are like, if you ever get one of those sinus headaches behind your eyes, it's one of those two bones. And they all have sinuses as part of them. This is the deepest bone in the skull. The only thing you really see of it in these models, you can really tell, and I mean, again, this is a real bone. Again, the difference is these get beat up, they get thin, real bones, they typically have that yellowish color. Here you can see inside the bones, it's called the trabecular pattern. So it's like a funny bone here. So the plastic bones retain the structure, so we can study them. This one, there's a plate. You can see in there, right in the middle, right between the two eyeballs. It's like a shelf of bone that points right up. 
you see it here, just want to drill a little more. It's bent a little bit, but that's because these bones are bent. I don't know if I can see them. I didn't bend it. That shelf is right there. So for those of you martial arts fans, when you hear about a martial arts movie, you film somebody pushing your nose up. That's the shelf of bone. That does a fancy name for that is the Kristen Gallery. So the bone kind of looks like this. I'll show you the. This is that shelf called the Kristen Gallery. Okay, because it was sort of cruciform shape. Okay, this is called the perpendicular plate. This is the upper portion of the bony nasal septum. You look inside any of these skulls, model or otherwise, into the nasal cavity, you have the nasal septum, the bony portion, is this little part. The upper portion is that perpendicular plate. This is, we'll get to it, this is the natural small bone, the bone. This is the facial bone, that's the bone. So, and then on either side of it, with this sort of cruciform of core shape, okay, this is called the cribiform. And interestingly, in the cribiform plate, we have little perforations. What sits on top here, and you see it when we do the sheep brain, is part of the olfactory nerve. It comes to stuff. And so all the olfactory nerve, the actual nerves, when I go down that so the, the anatomy is very significant. So Chris Galley, that forms because the coverings of your brain is an injury. Attached and full of tushes. That's why you kill somebody to keep the way you in the brain. Cribber form plate is the resting place where it pulls the olfactory holes. That's like the switching station for your olfactory nerve and smell. And then the perpendicular plate is the little portion of the bone and septum. So you'll see it here, and there's other stuff, okay? So I, I don't have one of these. We used to have it. I don't know where it, it's so small. And so the schematic I drew you, but this these are called lateral masses. If you look on the right side of the board, it says turbinates. So these are these lateral masses and the turbinates, which sit a little bit lower inside the nasal cavity, why we consider them a separate bone, I don't know, but they do. These give space, surface area for smell. I mean, conservatively, depending on who you read, we can smell about a million different smells. In the old days, it was always about 100,000. Now they think you can smell about a million different smells. But the more surface area of nose you have, the more you can smell. Okay. My dog has a, is a poodle mix. Okay, he has a big nose, as poodles do. He's not self-conscious about it, and he doesn't want to have a nose job. No work for the dog, but he's got that big poodle nose. Very useful for sticking in your pocket to grab something, which he does all the time. Take my dog. Please take my door. So that's the ethmoid bone. So I only got the one more to do, so I always save the hardest for last, and here it is. Sphenoid. Sphenoid bone. Complex doesn't do it justice. Keystone that all the other cranial bones work in our contact with. Where did you go? Ah, so this is one we call it disarticulated, so it's just a bone itself. If, if you look at it here, it's, this is these pieces that are sticking down here, 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 are already adhering with, with other bones. You can see the outline kind of like this way. So you really can't see it distinctively unless you have something like this where you can sort of pull it apart be able to discuss it. So this is that bone. So what are the highlight bones? This would be looking at the front. Your imagine your eyeballs would be there. 
So the first thing you can see with the eyeballs, the openings that are here, here and here, is you have a gas-like structure up here. That is called the superior orbital fissures. It forms because we have two wings. These are called lesser wings because they're smaller. These are called greater wings because they're larger. Where they come together, there is an opening. You're going to find that's very important because we four different major nerves that help you move your eyes up, down, side to side. All go through. Underneath it, this is another one of those odd wall ones. Down here, it looks like there's another one of these gashes. And it is named the inferior orbital fissure, but like that one I showed you before, this brain and last one, nothing goes through, it's a little part of it. It just shows up when we get bones ready to look at it. So it's not, it's, there's nothing to it, it's just it's sort of an oddball. So we have lesser wings, greater wings. Superior orbital fissure. On either side, if you go this way, I can do that. There's a hole. And if I go this way, same deal, we're going to be another hole. So, so what these two openings that crisscross are where the optic nerve comes from your eye, carrying it to your brain, eventually all the way back to the occipital lobes of the So those openings are called the optic canal. And the difference is, if I get superior orbital fissure, goes straight back, the optic canal goes crisscross. About 90% of your vision, but from your left eye, goes this way, from your right eye, that the other 10%, it kind of goes in the same side. It's a little stereoscopic vision. Is a three dimensionality. So, if somebody has to wear a patch on their eye or lose time, they lose some of the ability to see their depth person. My, my, my brother in law now lost an eye when he's in the Navy. So, he has to put glass on. I don't think he's even wearing this. So, it doesn't prevent you from working. He worked here at the Moon Water Treatment Facility. The township for like 40 years ago. Didn't stop him from having a few successful work. And so this is what it looks like. Now notice where it crosses over. That area where it crosses over, there's a cavity. You right, see the cavity where it crosses over. The crossover is called the optic chiasm, where the optic crosses over. On top of that, so you can't see here, when you get next to Semester, you're going to see the major blood supply to the interior of your brain comes from a circle of arteries that come together. It's kind of like what they call a roundabout or a traffic circle. We can next to the one in front of you. There's a vein of the existence of the drive. Nevertheless, how on a major holiday? You're going to Philadelphia and you get one of the dirty. Accidents every day. So that's called the circle of Willis. This is the optic chiasm. What it's sitting on top of, I'll take these out for you, is a cavity like depression. Okay, and it looks like a little saddle. And indeed, they named it Turk's saddle. The formal name in Latin is Sella Tersica. Turk's saddle. In that, and anytime you see bone enclosing something, something important. Sits inside here is your master gland. So the pituitary gland, the optic chiasm, and the circle of Willis are all in this little area. It's almost like if you could punch a hole from where your hard palate ends and the slug palate starts straight up, you'd be right there. So that's a really important structure. So we're not done, unfortunately. I put a little mark in there, you can see, you know, I'm sure. So we're not done. Now down here, and again, these are encased in bone anyway. So here they are here. And what they and here they are over here. You can see they're incorporated. Here's your hard palate. They're adherent to what these are called palatine bones. I'll show them to you separately. 
that's sort of the under area of the Yitzhak. And what they are not, because when anatomists saw them, they reminded them of a prehistoric flying creature, a bird or lizard. At that time, the emperor was Tramadons, they were pterodactyl. So these are called the pteroboid plates. And there's one medial and one lateral. Two next to each other on that side. And muscles attached all to medial and lateral pteroboids. They're the muscles that allow you to move your foot side to side and front to front. So there's four muscles. You have gralis, masseter, medial and lateral pteroboids. They're called the muscles of mastication. We chew with those. They're very powerful. Chewing muscles are big time. We'll get to that with training others. And then, the la- thankfully, the last feature I want to say are those three openings. Brain and rotundum. That's a nerve that integrates for pain your upper jaw. The brain and oval, it's oval. It integrates the lower jaw for pain and also integrates those chewing muscles. That little guy over here called the foramen spinosum. The foramen spinosum, this little spiny one that's going to be that. Our Jaffe King. It's a lesson. Okay. We'll get through it to you. I think you can call on my bush there. I just got a minute ago. And I just left all my mics. Right. We're not done. Don't pack up. We're almost done. It's okay. <laughs> that was the awkward part. That's okay. It's okay. We'll make the last part fast. How's that? <laughs> These are easy. Okay. There's only one that has anatomy in it. That's the jaw. It's the only one that moves. That's what's unique. All those other bones, they move. Say it in my way. I may speak eloquently now, but understand I can swear with the best of you. When you have a son who's in the Navy, you learn how to do that. So this is, now again, surely it was two bones they considered as one. Because we're born and we're already fused together. We're going to get some of that. So this is called the body, the part that has your teeth and the part that's here. Technically, this is called the mental area. I don't know why they named it that. This is the mandibular condyle. It's covered in cartilage. It's the part that allows that this is that, that boss and the temporal bone so you can move your jaw. This is where that temporalis muscle attaches to this coronoid process. These, anytime you see a piece of bone that kind of goes up an angle, the, te- the term we usually give is ramus or rama, R A M I, plural R A M U S. So where they meet is the angle of the jaw. So when this comes here, this goes there, this is the angle of the jaw. And we use this. The angle of the jaw is something you palpate if you're going to check somebody's carotid pulse, if you're going to start CPR, you want to see that. So this is the, each, anytime you have anatomy that protrudes, it's called surface anatomy, that's important. Because we know where stuff is in relation. <laughs> Lastly, so for all you people who are like me and hate going to the dentist, okay, there's a little opening on the interior. This is the mandible. The opening, and I'm putting this in here, it's for real, it's called the mandibular foramen. So these are surface anatomy, like this is important because you can feel it. But the dentist can feel it. So when they give you an injection from Admiral to work on your lower jaw, they want to give you one shot. Low plan sections I have a ton of experience with. Okay, are all about surface anatomy. If you anatomy, you put the medicine in there, they call it another thing, it's called lidocaine, for real. If they put it in here, it'll numb that whole side, but even overlap with it. That's what anatomy does, because nerves just don't stop it. 
So when you have to have like a cavity in your upper area, you've got to do several injections. It's a lot of fun. You don't have the luxury of having a convenient nerve for people to block. That can block sensors. So that's, so all the rest of these are pretty straightforward. Okay. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have the whole. So it goes faster after this. So we'll do it sort of simultaneously. This is, most of the facial bones are right here. The only one that is not in that little array. No, it's the right one to the left. Perpendicular place on top of the treatment. And your nasal cavity is bigger than you think. 
And lastly, one bone I didn't show, the two I didn't show you, this is your hard palate. You put your finger in your mouth, you can feel the bony portion of the maxilla. The back part of it are these two kind of L-shaped bones. They are palatine bones, mainly because they make it the palate. The little bump back here is actually in the organ. So technically, it forms a small, a very tiny portion. So the facial bones, palatine, maxillary, lacrimal, and one I have over here, diagrammatic, are the four facial bones, all paired bones, that make up the organ. The oddball, and I don't, I'll never ask you a question about it, this guy, that's that turbinate bone that's here. They consider it a separate bone. To me, it's just part of that increasing the surface area of the nose that allows us to smell so I'm getting here. Oy. There we are. Okie dokie. So here you have all that. So I, 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 again, I'll print these pictures for you. Here's the ethmoid. Now they're showing them to you. So you can see the cheekbone or zygomatic, the lacrimal, nasal, that one, that darker blue, maxillary that's there. Sutural bone's not a big deal. Here are, here are the names of them. They call, The turbinates are also called the inferior nasal conche. Mandible, the angle is important. The body is where the chin is. The coronoid process and the condylar process or condyle goes into that notch. And there's a notch in between the two of those. You'll see that. So here's mandibular notch, mandibular condyle. Coronoid process, this is the ramus, this is the angle the body. The maxillary, only thing, and there's, even though there's anatomy associated with it and there's a sinus with it, the inferior orbital fissure, like I said, is filled with cartilage, nothing goes through there. So there's really nothing that you have to worry about anatomically. That's there, and they're just showing it to you. The zygomatic, again, that, that one that's there. Nasal, bridge of the nose. Lacrimal, part of the orbit. And they have that little fossa and the bump you feel is the sac that's associated with the tear duct. And that's an opening into your nose. So it's like if somebody, if you have a cold, a lot of times you'll feel you'll be tearing up. That's a pathway sometimes for infection. It can go from your nose to your eye. That's one way you can get conjunctivitis. Little kids get conjunctivitis, they have dirty hands and rub their eyes. More often than not. And the palatine are those L-shaped bones. They make up the back of the palate and the vomer. So here's the vomer. Here's the palatine. Here's those conche bones that you saw before. And I think that is everything. The one bone that we don't have, and I'll show it to you, we talk about it in muscles. This bone is the only bone in your body that doesn't attach to another bone. It has wire here, so we don't lose it. It's called the hyoid. And muscles attach um, speaking for swallowing. So it's a bone that's kind of formed surrounding almost with the full and other muscles that are on them. So there's really not a lot to say about it. Where it's important is forensically because if somebody is strangling them, that bone is different. You have enough force to kill somebody from strangling them. I don't know. What is it called? Hyoid. H-Y-O-I-D. Hi -O -I -D. Oh, like thyroid. The thyroid. The thyroid, yeah. Exactly. The thyroid is the gland for Adam's apple. It's called the thyroid prominence or eminence. And you can actually, sometimes, depending on how much flesh your neck is, sometimes you can actually feel it. So it sounds like thyroid. And that's only, and you get to that in AP2. And there it is. That's all you got to know. See you later. Thank you, thank you. What? See right here. There's nothing here, right? Right. So when you touch right here. Yeah, that's cartilage. I mean, all our nose. Yeah, like a bone. Yeah, the bone is way up here, and those other bones are deep inside. You have a lot of cartilage. Noses are. When you see somebody, you know, in there, it used to happen to Roethlisberger, quarterback. 
He can hit the face and run from sideways. The next week, it looks like it was back. So you can put it back. And a lot of times, when people have no, have cosmetic repairs. They, they, you can sort of break the cartilage and they splint it. Yeah, most of the time it's cartilage, but when you're broken, those technically would have that. Tomorrow, next week, what are we doing? Pardon me? What are we doing next week? We're going to do all the extremity bones and we're going to do the spine. Okay. That's the plan of attack. Is this all the vertebrae? Vertebrae are the, yeah, the bones of the spine are the vertebrae. The spine is named for what sticks out in the back. Those are called spinous processes.